Good evening. 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 Um, thank you so much to Shakespeare and to Jumei for hosting us this evening. Woo! Yay. And for providing food. Um, tonight we have a talk on uh, Web Scraping 101 uh, by um, Anna Vasilovsky. Yes. Uh, and uh, here she is. So to 
These are basically simple machines that are dedicated to sit there with a bunch of files. And people connect with their browser, they request sites, and then they receive and then process those requests. And the way that the browser and the server talk to each other, that's called HTTP. It's just the language of request and response. So if I wanted to go, I wanted to go on Google and I wanted their homepage. I would type in Google.com, and then my browser would send a request to the server. It just sends a request saying, give me Google.com. It sends that instruction, and then it might send some other information about my browser along with that. Then Google's server takes my request, and it's going to send back pages that create that site that creates the actual Google homepage. That's all that is. HTTP is just request response, and that helps you with the download. So to understand the downloading process, all that required, all that's required is to understand this idea of request response. Now, the browser, once we receive a page, a page isn't necessarily just one thing. It could be made up of other different resources. Have HTML, CSS, JavaScript. HTML gives you structure, CSS kind of figures out how to display it all nicely. And if there's anything that's dynamic about the page, that's coming from JavaScript. So that's any kind of behavior and engine. <coughs> so to understand how to extract the actual content from a page, it's important to understand how these three different things interact and then figure out okay, what you need to extract from them. So, basically, downloading and processing, that's all a scraper is. So, a scraper is just a downloader and a processor. We're going to, anytime you're building a scraper, you just build a targeted downloader and a targeted processor. And that makes up your scraper. So, how do you actually build one? You figure out whatever question you're wrestling with, you find a target website. You figure out what's the website structure, how are those HTTP calls made, and how is the data actually presented to you. Then you basically write your scraper, so those two parts, that downloader and that processor, you test it out, then you deploy it, then maybe you want to run this scraper on a daily basis, whatever, then you basically repeat this process. Websites change, so you might have to refine what you're working. That's great. But how do you actually write one? So we're going to see a couple of examples right now. Um, to write a scraper, you just need to write the downloader and the processor. You have to tell the downloader what it is that they need to download that has the data. That downloader is just going to send requests, receive responses, and the processor is going to read those responses and extract the actual data from those responses. And then we can output those responses wherever we need them to a database or file. So I'm going to show you three examples of what I'm streaming. Uh, they're going to be in increasing orders of difficulty. Okay. The first one, so the general idea is going to be this. We're trying to extract news releases for some city that's stored on that city's website. So we're going to do three different examples. The first one's going to be the city of Mississauga, then we're going to go city of Burlington, and city of Toronto.
structure of their page, it's a little bit different. So they don't have all their news releases on a single page. They've basically got uh, data split up five news releases a page. And there's 108 news releases, and you gotta page to each page to get those news releases. But we see that everything just ends up in JavaScript, or sorry, in HTML. When we say go to the next page, it reloads the page, and we see that the actual page gets updated. So now we're, we've got a little bit more complicated from the first example where all our content is on one page. Now we have a little complication where our content is still in HTML, but it's just divided across the number of pages. So the only difference there is our downloader got a little bit more complicated. We just have to pay. Okay. Now, same as Toronto. They've also got a newsroom, right? It looks pretty much kind of like the Burlington one. <coughs> and okay, we'll just click around and see what that structure is. Okay, so we're getting new data, but our pages are reloading. So that's a signal to tell us that there's some kind of behavior in this page, so that's a signal that there's some JavaScript that we need to figure out what's going on. So that's another complication. So, that's going to be the third level of complexity. Let's start out with the Mississauga example, try to scrape that, and then build off of what we learned from there to get to the Burlington site and then the Toronto. So, to get the, Berlin, uh, the Mississauga, scrape that page. Relevant, but 
And there might be cases where that might come into play. Um, and it also tells the browser what kind of, uh, it tells the server what kind of uh, browser we're using, this user page. So we get this page. And to confirm that all the data is actually in here, we can just request this one thing. So I use, um, it's an app that comes, that you can download from Google Chrome. It's called Postman. What you can do is you can basically just send that request. It, it, you can just tell it to just do one request. So you send that request, and then you can preview the page. It's a little bit broken because we haven't downloaded all the rest of the content. But we can see that all that data is actually in here. So if I were to just download, request this one page, and then extract out the data, I'd be fine. So that's what we're doing. So in order to make requests, these HTTP requests, uh, there's an external Python library called Request. Um, and it's just a little wrapper that makes it really nice to get requests. So there's this request library, and there's a call to just to make this HTTP get call. All you do is pass it a uh, URL, and then you can get the response, and then take out the text. Okay, so that's all. Extracting out the actual name. 
the URL to that link. Um, we just because it's a relative link, we just join it up with the actual page link, and that creates a full link. And then we take out the title, and we take out the date, and then we have this option. And then 
making sure that our actual content is in there. When we do that, we get an HTML page and we have uh, the title and uh, the date as well as some content about the actual article. But all we care about is the title, the link to the article, and the date. So the only thing that, that complicates our scraper from before is that we have a page. So now instead of one URL that we use, we just have this URL format with the page kind of uh, customizable. We're not going to download all the pages, but we're going to just download the first five, um, and we're not going to save them. What you could do when you actually download these pages, you might want to save these uh, for processing or for storage, because you might want to do other, other things as well. Right now, we're just going to store it in memory. We're going to page through the first five pages. But it's really important that if you have multiple pages that you're going to request, don't just send all of those to the server at once. Uh, if you have a bunch of different machines, you can have each of them hitting the server. It doesn't look like you're trying to spam that server, but a lot of servers they have rules set around how many requests you can actually make at a time. Uh, for example, Google they will actually uh, they'll give you a little caption to fill out if uh, you if they think you're a robot because you made too many requests. So what you should do is throw in a sleep just between each page request, sleep for a couple seconds. Uh, Right now, what I'm showing you, I'm just sleeping for a specific fixed amount of time. My recommendation uh, is to actually randomize how much you sleep. So usually when I create scrapers, what I do is I'll say sleep between 5 and 20 seconds, depending on what speed I'm trying to download at. <coughs> this makes it less likely that you will get kind of targeted as a bot that's either trying to spam your server like I said, uh, so here, all we're doing, we just have to do this download cookies multiple times. We're going to basically just, from that formatted URL, we're going to throw in the page number. We create a full URL, create a request, save that request in memory, and then page two. And then we're going to sleep for a couple seconds. Once we have all those pages downloaded, we're going to parse the same way. So, we can look at the actual structure of the page. So, we see this print area is not everything, uh, but let's just isolate one article. That basically, there's each article is contained in a div that's got this news item class on it. So if we were to parse out each of those individual news items, now we have these news items, and then on each news item we can just parse out the actual data that we need. We see that uh, basically the title is contained in a link. You have uh, a relative link again the actual article, the title of the article, and then in this new title header, you have actual text to the name. So to get the actual date, you just scrape off that toasted piece, and then we have the date. So um, that's basically what we do. We take the HTML from each individual page, or this new object, um, basically take out all the news items, they'll become little suits for each new item. And then for each news item, we actually call this parser. So the title is in the text in the link in that news item. Um, the URL is also on that link. And then the date is just on that posted date. But we just replace this posted part with just, we just cut that out. And then we have uh, each of these dates, each of these dates. So when we run that, we're basically requesting the first page, sleeping right now, saying sleep for three seconds at the same time. Um, we're 
basically saving each of those pages. Now we process each individual page. The, the most time consuming part is the actual uh, downloading part. And then when we actually open the CSP, we have the same. So the only complication that we had in this case from before is that we just had the page. And we needed to make sure that when we were making those requests, we, you know, we were kind to the server by having a little bit of a gap between each request. The last case uh, is the city of Toronto. So now we've seen a couple of HTML pages. That's easy. You see some paging. That's great. But now we have this page. But when we try to get these news articles, we see that every time we page, we're actually uh, we're not reloading the page. So that content's got to be coming from somewhere, but it's got to be buried in some JavaScript because this is part of the behavior of the page. So let's kind of see what's going on. So we look at the page. To see the actual requests and responses coming through. So the main idea why we think there's some background requests is because there's 11,000 of these news articles and there's no way that those are all downloaded at the beginning of the page. So that's why there's probably being loaded a bit at a time. So to kind of see what's going on, we see this first set of results. Let's try and load the last batch of results and see what's happening. This part here, this is just kind of a window into the different kind of requests, like visually what's going on. You can sort of isolate which content is downloaded in a specific window of time. Let's try to see, if we just find the last news articles, we're right over here, and we see that two files were requested. When we look at the first file, There's not. There's no response data. It's just a call with a bunch of uh, query parameters and just some metadata for the request. But there's no actual content coming back. When we look at the second request, we see that okay, this looks kind of informative. We have actual news articles, but they're kind of wrapped in this JSON callback. So this is basically just looks like some JSON with this in buried in this function. So if we were to take out this JSON callback and this semicolon and close the bracket here, we basically have a JSON object that we can parse out and get actual data from. Now let's see what the link actually looks like. See, okay. Uh, well, we can actually use these uh, request headers down here in query certain parameters. You can actually see what's being sent. So you see that we're sending a start and a count. <coughs> and that start basically kind of looks like 11,000. So that's kind of matching up to uh, the first result that we're sending, we're getting back, and the count is 10. Okay? So, Let's see if we can send a request like this, but let's just say we want the first result. Start at the first result, give us back 10 results. We can see, okay, we can get something back. It looks similar. First article is the Toronto Public Health to launch pop up. <coughs> First article, Toronto Public Health. So we can see that if we were to just request these uh, pages with these JSON, now we can use that to extract, to extract the content that we need. So we identified the actual link to the data that we need. Start an account. Okay. 
to download. We're just going to download the first five pages. And again, we're just going to sleep in between each page. Go download. So that's just downloading. Got 
the URL, like I said, just take that text ID, throw it onto the URL that we have for each individual. Go to 
this one URL. But there might be cases where you have to log into something. There, you could either have some kind of logic to first walk through it. But after that, what happens is one of those headers that you see is called a cookie. That cookie actually tells servers about you that you're logged in. So after you log into a site, you have a cookie injected into your machine, which every time you go to a site, that follows you. And that identifies the fact that you are the person that's logged into the site. So there might be cases where you might want to actually keep that around. So that's the headers. There might be proxies and things like that. Those are more complicated situations. This is just a very basic kind of description of scrapers, there's downloaders, and processors. These are very simple examples. So, uh, kind of cap off, we saw what problems scrapers address, how they work, and how to build them. Uh, basically, from a high level as well as some tools. sort of like some scraping projects that you've worked on before just to like give us an idea of where to start? Uh, so I started scraping, um, I was doing some retail sites, uh, just I wanted to try out scraping. Uh, so like for example I was scraping Zara, so that's why I know the kind of geolocation part. Um, do you have like, what are you, what are you looking for? Um, I come from a journalism background, so like, or like, I mean for like what content? Uh, sorry, I don't, like, I don't know what you mean. Like, you want to just, like, like a trial project to kind of try out? What's yeah, I guess so. Like, I'm just curious to hear about, was this a project that you actually worked on, or, like, I don't know. I'm always kind of, like, looking for applications when I'm getting started on learning something, so just hearing about how you've applied it would be helpful. Yeah, so I used it uh, to look, I used it, uh, so I was just looking at pricing information, um, so I just wanted to see if I could track prices uh, over time. Um, so I was looking at Zara, Banana Republic. Sometimes you have some of those 
those sites, they look the same. So you might build a scraper. For example, Banana Republic, the Gap, Old Navy, they're like three properties for the same owner. So if you build a scraper for one, you can get content for all three. Okay. Um, I've used it to aggregate events. So a lot of the time, sometimes the sites, I want to just see a whole bunch of information, but it's just not presented the way I want. So let's say I wanted to look at all the past events for a specific meetup group. I don't want to page through each individual. For me, it's much faster to just build up something really simple to scrape each other. And then did you run those requests like once a day from your computer, or did you use another server? So for I started out just doing things once a, once a day. Um, for that pricing, when I was looking at some of the retail data, um, basically I built a proxy harvester as well. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, like I mentioned, you don't want to be spamming servers. So, I was trying to do a lot of content on a regular basis. So, and I didn't want to have a whole bunch of servers to use. So, there's these free sites that have proxies on them. What I would do is I identify the proxy sites. I would scrape them, and then what I would do is I would look for ones that would. So some what some proxies don't actually hide your IP. Uh, so what I would do is I would download these lists, and then I had a program that it was just a server. I would hit that server to check if that proxy was actually anonymizing, <laughs> and then I would save it, and then I basically had. Um, I was using something called GrabMQ. It's kind of like a messaging. It's basically you can create these information queues that you can load up. Uh, so they're not stored in the database because these things aren't fresh. I wanted to just have them on the fly. Um, I would just push these IPs on there, and then I would have these little. Um, I would have like a master script, like a script master. So it's like this one program. Which would have a, like a few different processors for each individual page because I didn't want. And what I would do is I would have that master. He would get a list of sites to download just generically, and then he would kind of push those out to each of his little slaves. And those slaves would be responsible to download the proxy from that list of proxies, and then they would basically download. They would go through, for example. All of Banana Republic, all of HM. That's kind of, you're building architecture on top of something. So, the purpose of my talk is to kind of give you an idea of what this is. So, it starts really simple. I can download a page and I can get data. I'm just system, systematizing the process. If you want. So, you can apply this to whatever you're trying to do. So, if you visit a site on a regular basis and it's full of ads and you don't want to look at those, Like 20, 10, 20,000 
location requests for some of their APIs. And actually, for example, sorry, Google Maps. And even then, Google Maps, their API that they provide you, they provide you results of places in a given location. But those results are actually biased. What they do is they filter what information you're going to get. So they're gonna, you're, it's going to be biased in the sense of you're not necessarily going to get actual locations for what you need in a certain geography. It's going to be biased to what they surface in a result. And Google Maps is one of those things that you're going to have a really hard time scraping. It's not this simple. Any more questions? Yep. Does uh, different problems with taking like browsers do the requests with you? Uh, yes. So one of, the only way that uh, the server knows what browser you're using is this user agent. So if you, what you would do is you would, what I do is I just copy the user agent from Chrome and then I put that into my request and then it looks like my user agent. For example, Phantom.js, uh, when you send out a request, it's, so Phantom.js is like a headless browser, it's like JavaScript. It's kind of similar, you can do similar stuff where you can build kind of, you can still build scrapers with Phantom.js as well. Uh, it's just a JavaScript. But when it sends out requests, it tells you, it tells the server that it's JavaScript, it's a Phantom.js user agent. So what you can do is you would inject it with the user agent from Chrome, then it looks like you're using Chrome. That's the only thing that identifies you as not Chrome. Is, is Python best being used for this sort of thing? Um, actually, I've been experimenting. So when I started scraping, I was using Python just because it's, this was, I started scraping, the first time I tried it was like 2014, so about two years ago. Um, and it, you, you can see kind of it's a bit it's a bit of work to set up a script, um, and now a lot of sites are seeing a lot more dynamic things like with JavaScript. Um, there's even some ideas to have like some compiled stuff in JavaScript. Uh, so I'm looking at basically using actually Phantom JS to build. What I'm going to try to do is build kind of my own scraping XML uh, kind of language to be able to just build create like a scraper now markup language that gives instructions of, okay, this is what you're going to get. So what I would do is I would load pages. They get rendered in JavaScript. So the actual, all the processing is done. And then I'm just left with this final HTML of the actual page, like I see in my browser. So I'm not looking for each request. Then I, when I script the scraper up, it looks more like, um, like a person actually the way that you write it is a little different. Instead of looking at it from a single level, you're kind of looking at it from like a, a browser usage. So I tried to use Phantom.js for screens, but I was okay. running into weird problems on the videos where I don't know if you ran into any errors when you were trying to. Like what kind of errors? I, I just started looking at Phantom.js. I just found, for example, I was trying to get some pricing data from Walmart. And without that rendering, there's no way I'm going to be able to get that information without that rendering. It's just, I'm not, the data that's coming through, sometimes it's encrypted, sometimes it will just be a bunch of binary. So I would prefer it's much easier to just see the process. 